Okay. Welcome everyone to this virtual grand rounds on lessons learned for obstetric anesthesia during COVID-19. Thank you so much for joining us all today. I'm Kitty Jenkin, a program manager at Lifebox. Before I hand you over to our chair, we just have a couple of formalities to share with you. Today, we're gonna to have a 40 minute panel discussion followed by 40 minutes for an online question and answer session. Please write any of your questions in the Zoom chat and we will try and answer as many as we can today. Another thing to note is that we have French and Spanish interpretation this afternoon. If you would like to listen to this in French or Spanish, head to the globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and choose the correct language. Any difficulties, please write in the chat and we will try and help. I'm now gonna hand over to our chair today, Dr. Emilia Gauch. Dr. Gauch, thank you so much for stepping in to chair this session last minute. We're very appreciative. Dr. Gauch is an anesthesiologist working as chief in obstetric anesthesia at the Hospital Universitario La Paz in Madrid. She's also Vice President of SEDA, the Spanish Society of Anesthesia, Reanimation and Pain Treatment, and a member of the WSA Obstetric Anesthesia Committee. Dr. Kausch, thank you so much. I'm gonna now hand over to you to introduce our panelists. Emilia, just remember uh, to unmute, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I just realized that. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to whoever is joining us. Uh, thank you, Kitty, for your kind introduction. And thank you also to Lifebox for hosting these events today and to our core sponsor, WFSA. For those of you who are not familiar with Lifebox, Lifebox is a charity working to make surgery and anesthesia safer throughout the world. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, Lifebox has prioritized adapting and developing tools and the strategies to support colleagues as they work on the front line of this global health emergency. This work has included a series of webinars on important topics for surgical and anesthetic providers working during the pandemic. Thank you to all, to all of our panelists today for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Let me introduce them, uh, all of them briefly. Dr. Manjusha Shah is a consultant anesthesiologist in Maharashtra, India, and is based on the Naval Maternity and Nursing Home in Solapur in the Naval Maternity Endoscopy and Infertility Center in Sion, Mumbai. She has a special area of interest in obstetric anesthesia and analgesia, anesthesia for, and anesthesia for laparoscopic surgeries. Dr. Manjusha is Lifebox faculty for its Safer Anesthesia Work and Safe OR Workshop. The next speaker, the next panelist, is Dr. Rudit Shimles Workne, who is an anesthesiologist at Gandhi Memorial Maternity Hospital in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Dr. Ridit also mentors the Lifebox Fellows as part of Lifebox Clean Cut Work in Ethiopia. The next panelist will be Dr. Monica Cialos, who is Director of Anesthesia Department at Hospital de Maternidade Santa Joana in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Dr. Monica Cialus is also Director of Obstetric Anesthesia at Santa Casa de Misericordia de Sao Paulo, an affiliated hospital to Facultade de Medicina de Santa Casa de Sao Paulo School of Medicine. Welcome to, uh, to you, to all of you, and to all the attendees of today's event. We have, we have all witnessed the terrifying devastation that this pandemic has brought across the globe, both in terms, of, in terms of numbers of lives lost and for pushing health systems to the brink of collapse. Globally, the WHO has reported nearly 27 million COVID-19 cases and nearly 1 million deaths, 900,000 deaths currently. In the last week, there, there were more than 1.8 million new cases on 37,000 new deaths. And as healthy providers, we are all aware that this pandemic is far from over. 
thousands of COVID positives or suspected, suspected patients will have had to undergo obstetric anesthesia or analgesia procedure at any time because this is one of the activities that cannot be stopped at any time, delivery. Our workload has continued unabated and yet we've had to work with key resources being diverted, infected patients, a lack of protocols and PPE, all whilst trying to keep ourselves and our colleagues safe. We hope that today will help provide some clarity as we share lessons learned from the first wave and probably this beginning of the second wave and have the opportunity to answer questions that we are all grappling within the face of this new virus and we continue our work in providing quality care to our patients. A quick reminder that for those of you wishing to watch this webinar in either French or Spanish, head to the bottom of your screen and select the globe icon and write any question that you may have into the chat. And now let's go on to the discussion. But first, I'd like to uh, give the, the, the word, the first word to Dr. Manjusha, to, to Dr. Shah, I'm sorry, to Dr. Manjusha Shah. It's your turn to talk about safe general anesthesia in pregnant COVID-19 positive patients. What do we need to take in consideration for C-sections and for non obstetric surgery in pregnant COVID-19 women? Dr. Shah, yes. could you start with your yes. presentation? Uh, yes, yes. Good evening, everyone. And uh, good morning to all our colleagues from other part of the world. Uh, I first thank uh, Lightbox Foundation for giving us opportunity to be a part of this webinar and interact with all our colleagues uh, from a different part of the world. Now I, will, I would like to share my screen. So presently, in India, there are increase in number of COVID-19 cases. And right now, according to Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, the number of cases that has reached up to 42 lakhs and the recovery rate also has been increased as uh, around 77%. And death rate is 1.7% that has come to uh, very less uh, right now, and it has come down. Now, regarding uh, this guideline that ICMR, that is the Indian Council of Medical Research, that has come up with the uh, guidelines and protocols, and healthcare system that is again developed, and uh, uh, it has uh, uh, developed COVID-19 facilities all over the world, all over the uh, country. Uh, so that uh, the recovery rate has been increased. Now, uh, one more point that I would like to add. That uh, COVID testing rate, it has also been increased like uh, the RT-PCR, rapid antigen test, and uh, cv net etc. So according to ICMR, there are 80% uh, of the patients that uh, they are asymptomatic and they present with mild disease. Now regarding the safe general anesthesia for caesarean section, again, we are always worried about the uh, aerosol generating procedure like intubation as well as extubation. Now, every day, protocols are changing in COVID-19 pandemic. There are different, different protocols like ICMR, ISA, FOXI. But uh, you take all, gather all the information and create your own protocols that suit your uh, local infrastructure. 
because hospital practices they differ from uh, place to place and the resources again that are available at one place are not available at another place and the basic principles are same and that are applicable to all one need to take universal precautions for every patient entering the facility assuming that she carries covid disease now when we are thinking of safety of uh, parturian we need to keep few points in our mind that the safety of healthcare provider is very important there is no emergency in pandemic donning and doffing takes time so delays may be possible and should be informed to patients as well as relatives at the time of counseling now preparation for anesthesia it starts outside ot like pre anesthetic check up that we can do it by tele or video conferencing ask the patient to put well fitting 9 n95 mask on patient's face and transfer the patient through green corridor always prepare for the drugs as well as uh, airway equipments before the patient comes in operation theater and anesthesia provider who is giving anesthesia which should don uh, a pp before the patient comes in operation theater and is very important to follow covid 19 surgical safety checklist that is going to reduce morbidity as well as mortality so level 3 pp kit should be uh, recommended that is recommended for uh, uh, all the covid 19 positive surgeries as a uh, aerosol generation uh, that is the main uh, uh, concern that we are worried about and this level 3 pp kit that include well fitted 995 mask surgical cap face shield goggles fluid resistant gown and shoe cover and two pair of gloves and the outer gloves should be removed once the intubation is done now transfer the patient to dedicated covid ot which is a negative pressure ot with 12 to 25 air exchanges per hour as far as possible use disposable equipments and level 3 pp should be worn by all the members in operation theater minimize the number of staff in operation theater and priority should be given to experienced providers keep one runner outside the ot to whenever help is required now as you all know that uh, duraxil anesthesia is a gold standard technique for cesarean section again it is advantageous in covid 19 uh, scenario because it minimizes the uh, aerosol generation but we need to give general anesthesia in certain situations where neuroaxial anesthesia is contraindicated as in coagulation abnormality and uh, even uh, where the, there is a threat of life to mother as well as fetus dr shah is yes? is that is that banging from inside your apartment pardon emilia was the banging from inside your apartment Dr. Sharp, do continue. Yeah, yeah. So we are always worried about this aerosol generating procedure that we need to uh, do intubation as well as extubation and bag mask ventilation. Now we need to take precautions during intubation. Pre-oxygenate with five for five minutes with low flows like five to six liters per minute. Use two-handed technique to ensure tight seal. Rapid sequence induction is recommended to induce anesthesia. Always avoid ba- bag mask ventilation or if needed, you can ventilate gently with low flows. If available, go with the video laryngoscope and secure the airway with cuffed endotracheal uh, tube and uh, always put. Uh, Uh, viral filters like HEPA filter, HME filter. Uh, allow other persons to enter the operation theater once the intubation is secure. Ventilate after the cuff is inflated to minimize the leak around the cuff. Avoid unnecessary disconnection. Give full dose of muscle relaxer, and always uh, keep in mind that in case of unanticipated difficulty in intubation, second generation supraglottic airway devices can be. 
We can induce the patient with etomidate or propofol. It all depends on the hemodynamic stability of the patients. Good analgesia is provided with fentanyl. And uh, another thing is that oxytocin, that is the drug of choice as an utilotum. Now, what are the precautions to be taken during extubation? Avoid excessive suctioning and consider inline suctioning if it is available. Leave viral filter on endotracheal tube while disconnecting. Minimize cuffing during extubation, or you can use a transparent polythene sheet. That can, um, uh, but it can one can take the care of that to dispose it properly and roll it properly. Can we can keep a dedicated tray for contaminated items, and doffing should be done in dedicated area. So COVID-19, it has changed our routine clinical practice. We must adopt and accept the new normal. Simulation training is important for staff, and very important is debriefing after each case to improve the health system and reduce the uh, morbidity as well as mortality. So the safety checklist that is developed by Lightbox as well as WFSA, and uh, to minimize the healthcare provider exposure when operating COVID positive patients and suspected patients. So that includes everything, how to go with donning, doffing step by step. And so we can go with uh, this checklist and it can be used in conjunction with WSO safety checklist. So all these uh, precautions uh, are needed to be taken when we are going for general anesthesia and uh, we need to take safety precautions like PP kit uh, as it is a aerosol generating procedure. Thank you very much, Dr. Shah, for, for your outstanding lecture. And uh, now I will try to clarify or to share with you some aspects of regional anesthesia for uh, COVID-19 patients for C-section or even for labor. And uh, let me share the, the, the screen. And also some few aspects uh, about um, some few aspects about anticoagulation. Can you see my presentation? Well, I hope so. You can, it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. As I was telling you, obstetric anesthesia and analgesia and deliveries in general cannot be stopped during the pandemic. All civil and, lab and uh, working activities have been stopped because of the pandemic and quarantines, quarantines that we have suffered in our different countries. But we couldn't stop our activity despite the wave that was coming to us and found us prepared or not so prepared. We will try to go through uh, into a brief introduction to know where we are at the moment that we know uh, slightly more things than six months ago to speak about regional anesthesia and analgesia, what to do in case of failure, some few words about PPE as Dr. Shah has uh, given us uh, some highlights and some few words about COVID coagulopathy and anticoagulation to try to finish with some clear uh, take home messages. Now, it has been uh, recently published uh, a, car uh, a review of the current evidence, and we had something to compare with. We had to compare uh, COVID 19 with SARS and MERS, and it looks that it's less severe than COVID 19, than, than SARS and MERS. That means COVID 19 looks less severe in pregnant patients. But if we compare pregnant women with COVID-19, with non-pregnant women, the outcomes are worse in pregnant women. The need for hospitalization, if it happens, it will appear approximately at the seventh day, at the seventh day of the onset, since the onset of the symptoms. Fatal and neonatal outcomes can be worse, can be bad, and can, but there is no evidence of placental transmission nowadays 
although it's possible, and there is some pathological evidence of placental damage that we don't know until the moment if it's clinically relevant or not. Sometimes we have to start a preterm delivery for severe case, doing a good balance between maternal and fetal risk. It has been also recently published, this systematic review and meta-analysis, when they pay attention to what it happens with maternal outcomes. And women with COVID-19 have an increase in the mortality rate, have an increase also in the need of ICU admission, and they increase the risk also of preterm birth define it as less than 37 weeks of gestation and increase the risk also of C-section. About comorbidities and risk factors, age over 35 uh, years old, maternal age over 35 and BMI over 30 kilograms per square meter are definitively risk factors as they are comorbidities, any com comorbidity especially hypertension, preeclampsia, and asthma. They're risk, fa risk factors for bad outcomes in COVID-19 patients. This is a short series of pneumonia pregnant patients that come from Spain, and the symptoms are mainly cough, a dry cough, dyspnea, and even fever. But as you may know, the symptoms of COVID-19 patients, even with pneumonia, are very similar to any other conditions. But we have to be especially careful with the symptomatic patients. We have seen several months, a few months uh, ago, in a very nice publication of New England Journal of Medicine, that up to 15% of patients, uh, pregnant patients COVID-19 positive, are absolutely asymptomatic. So nowadays, we perform the test in every single pregnant patient who comes to our maternal hospital. In terms of the results of delivery, at the beginning of the pandemic, the, the result of the delivery was uh, nearly 100% of C-sections. As the main, uh, the main studies came from China, where the, rate, the cesarean section rate is really high. But we have been knowing more and more the sickness and our uh, cesarean delivery rate is not more than 40% nowadays. A lot of protocols have come out and I'd like to highlight this one coming from the UK and developed by the Obstetric Anesthetics Association where they really encourage and recommend the use of neuroaxial labor analgesia and a regional anesthesia techniques for cesarean section. As we know that there is a lower risk with regional anesthesia techniques than with general anesthesia. As in the UK, they have a lot of experience with Entonox. They uh, believe it's not an aerosol generating procedure. But we in Spain, as we are sharing experience, we do not recommend it in Spain because it's not such a, a huge, uh, we don't have such a huge experience and we think it could be an aerosol generating procedure. But the protocols that have been developed by these societies and many others have to be tailored to our hospital needs and they have to be also uh, simulated. We need a checklist for not to forget any single detail and to try to avoid failures in our techniques. The protocols start before the labor epidural, continue during the labor epidural, and do not finish until we leave the room and we doff the PPE. Before the epidural, we have to prepare outside the room the drugs, the kits, the PPE, and inside the room it will be waiting for us, the lady, the partner, and the informed consent should be signed inside the room to avoid contamination. We, we will do routine techniques during labor epidural. It is not the time to innovate, and it's the moment for the experts to start. And we have to pull out the external gloves to try to uh, do the programmation of the pump 
properly and without any additional contamination. And please do not leave the room too early until you have checked properly that the block works uh, perfectly and there are no any complications. If you have to come in unexpectedly into, to, into the delivery room, it will be an additional risk for all of us. But sometimes, even uh, up to 40% or even more in some places, we have to perform a C-section. And we have to answer these questions. Where, when, and how to perform safely for all the elements, the cesarean section. The key is communication. To try to avoid, as Dr. Schatz mentioned it a few minutes ago, to avoid category one C-section. Top up in the delivery room could be a good option if we can go with the lady with the PPE on to the operating theater. And we have to use the epidural catheters with a thrust and safe preparation. What, with whatever you do normally, it's not the moment to innovate. But if you don't have a labor epidural working, we have to do a fast spinal. And if we have to pull out the catheter, the epidural catheter because of failure, a lower dose spinal is a good option. And if you have the possibility, a combined spinal epidural, everything is to try to avoid a general anesthesia. We have performed a technical document uh, with our Ministry of Health, uh, and we have uh, it's available in the web page of our Ministry of Health with, about which PPE and when. And we join the, the example of the UK protocols as uh, traffic lights from the basic uh, equipment, from the basic PPE for labor epidural to intermediate for C-section and the regional anesthesia up to the maximum and enhanced for general anesthesia or, where it, or, or when there is a high risk for conversion. It is very, very important to have checklists checklist that have been developed by, the, by different societies, including the WBFSA uh, and also a joint protocol with the ASRA, and to use safe practices. I repeat, it's not the moment to innovate. We have to choose the right procedure for the right patient at the right moment and to be vigilant to try to prevent complications and not to do anything with uh, an extreme emergency. This is the example of Lifebox and WB FSA uh, checklist that can be combined with the WHO surgical safety checklist. And we have to start preparing things before the uh, patient arrives or even before uh, start the transfer to the operating theater. This is another way, a graphic way to see that the planning for cesarean delivery should start before the transfer into the operating theater and we'll have to answer every single question and to pay attention to every single step that should be done during this uh, procedure. We have to practice and simulate. We, have to, we need to have special areas for donning and doffing, not complicated, but yes, special areas. And we have to be sure that we are properly trained and to have prepared trays and not the trolleys in the operating theater because they can become contaminated. From the practical point of view, the practical recommendations to perform a regional anesthesia for cesarean delivery is to do a spinal or to do an epidural. If you have to do a spinal or even better, combine a spinal epidural, use hyperbaric bupivacaine if you have. Combine it with fentanyl and morphine and be generous with the dose. Be sure that the, the spinal will work. Do an active and proactive prophylaxis of hypotension because it will be a good source of nausea and vomiting that, will, that can contaminate the, the operating theater additionally and increase the risk for all of us. If you have an epidural working for labor analgesia, top up with what you have uh, what you used to do. Lidocaine is what we used to do when we are in really hurry or ropivacaine 0 0.75. But it's also fine, bupivacaine 0 0.5, if you don't have anything more than that. And if you have to 
deal with a, a failed epidural, do a spinal with a lower dose. And if you have possibility, do a combined spinal epidural. Some few words about COVID coagulopathy that has been characterized during the last few months. And it's related to the cytokine storm and the hyperinflammation. It is uh, associated to an increased D dimer that is a poor outcome marker. And it's also rela related to pulmonary microthrombi and pulmonary embolism that, uh, whose incidence depends on the ethnic population that you belong to. Caucasic uh, patients look more prone to this coagulopathy. It, it's, uh, it consists in an activation of coagulation that is different from the septic DIC, and uh, it's, character, it's characterized by a thrombotic microangiopathy and an important increase of the dime. In pregnancy, it is especially important because it, as it is related with an hypercoagulability, it is, uh, there are many reasons that make us think that the patient will be under a severe risk for pulmonary embolism, infection, immobilization, and other COVID and non-COVID associated factors, plus pregnancy, that it's an hypercoagulable state. This coagulopathy can correlate to a third trimester coagulopathy, it improves fast after delivery, and as in non-pregnant patients, D-dimer is also a marker of severity, especially if it is over 1,000. Let's remember that pulmonary embolism is a leading cause of maternal mortality, especially in the developed world. And think always that it could be a problem in COVID-19 patients, but also in other patients. The uh, Obstetric Anesthetic Association and also our national protocols use this recommendation. The use of low molecular uh, weight heparin in all pregnant women with COVID-19 unless delivery is expected in the next 12 hours. But we have to take into consideration that if we, if we are going to perform an araxial block, we have to respect the safety intervals before and after to perform an araxial block and before and after to pull out an epidural catheter. Don't, let's not have uh, two problems. We have had experience during the maximum, uh, maximum uh, incidence of COVID-19 in our country from March to May, we had a bit more than 1,000 deliveries and we had 25% uh, of C-sections during that period. That percentage increased up to 39% in our population of COVID-19 patients that at this moment were 36. Nowadays, we have more than 60. And uh, we had 21 uh, the, uh, vaginal deliveries, and of them, 90% of them were under epidural analgesia because we were very proactive encouraging women to have an epidural catheter. For cesarean deliveries, we have two of them from the liver room and 12 of them from first indication. And only three patients had a general anesthesia. One of them because of contraindication of neuroaxial anesthesia. One of them, of, uh, two of them uh, were converted from a regional anesthesia to a general, one of them for acritism and the other one for failure, the accretism was because of a massive hemorrhage, and only one severe patient who was managed under spinal initially and who passed away on the fourth day because of a pulmonary embolism. Finally, the take home messages start with safety safety for everyone. For everyone. If we feel safe, we will do it better with our patients and safety starts with a good preparation, good protocols, checklist, and simulation. Advice for an epidural, call the expert, is the moment for the expert to give the best of their knowledge and be sure that the epidural works. The communication is even more important in these moments. Use good doses and generous doses for a spinal. 
use routine protocols. It is not the moment to prove new things and avoid general anesthesia. And don't forget aerosolization and extubation is also a dangerous moment. Regarding thromboembolism, there is, remember that there is a specific coagulopathy more in more severe cases and often related with pulmonary embolism. Recommend and remind always the systematic anticoagulation and also be careful with system safety intervals to perform neuraxial blocks or to pull out an epidural catheter to try to avoid additional complications. Thank you very much. I cannot hear you. Well, I now I'd like to introduce Dr. Cialus that will speak about the maintaining access to uh, cesarean sections. We have all heard of the heartbreaking stories of the lives of women and babies being lost after being turned away from hospitals after being suspected to be COVID positives. So please, Monica, could you start sharing your presentation with us? Um, just a second. Hi, everyone. Uh, is it the screen okay? Sound is great. Okay. First of all, I would like to thank you for the nice invitation to participate uh, in such a webinar. It's really a fantastic experience to communicate with people all over the globe. And uh, I will, the topic of my presentation is a short presentation. I will talk about lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic here in Brazil, both as uh, a, 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 a Brazilian person and with uh, being within this in this country, and also as my personal experience in running uh, an obstetric anesthesia department in one of the biggest private maternity hospitals in Brazil. So. Um, well, so the objectives of my brief talk is first to describe the current situation of the COVID-19 in Brazil and also uh, to report the experience of running the anesthesia department of, of one of the biggest private maternity hospitals in Brazil. Well, as you, uh, as you might know, uh, and unfortunately, Brazil uh, are leading the numbers in terms of the COVID-19 disease. Uh, we had so far more than 40 million, uh, 4 million uh, Brazilian people infected and more than 100,000 deaths so far. And the Brazilian population is 210 million people which gives us a rate of cases per 100,000 people of 1,973 and uh, uh, rates of deaths per 100,000 people of 60.4. So the situation uh, here in Brazil is far from being the ideal situation. We have huge, num huge numbers of maternal deaths and huge numbers of Brazilian people being infected. And what are the main problems of living in a country like this? Brazil is huge and we still have huge social and economic discrepancies among the, the, the states that we have here in Brazil. So it's like having several countries in one single country. Uh, the kind of uh, the quality of care the the the, uh, the kind of care you receive depends much uh, uh, depends much of the fact if you really have access to good quality of care or not. And also another problem as a country is that we are still facing a lack of alignment between the federal and the state government. So. Uh, depending uh, on which state you are currently living, you are having different uh, you are having receiving different uh, rules, 
and and that may be not uh, well aligned with the federal rules. We still have and facing a lack of availability of exams to test for the COVID-19, even in the private practice. So sometimes we do have exams, but we do not have time uh, to have it completed. And uh, there are days that we're still not having exams, even in the private practice. And also uh, that's public uh, all over the world, that it's all the newspaper everywhere that we are still having low adherence to the quarantine rules. So this is the big picture of our country, you know, a big number of people infected, the big numbers of maternal, uh, uh, not only maternal, but people, a big number of people deaths, and we are facing, uh, this is the context where the anesthesiologists are working. And it can be better or worse depending on uh, the place uh, where you at in Brazil. Uh, but now uh, it seems that when we analyze the, those dynamic data, that things are going to start to become a little bit more uh, easier for us because both in terms of the new cases and the number of them, deaths, it seems that our curve is starting to going down, you know. Uh, but this past six months here in Brazil, it has been really difficult. And especially for the anesthesiologists who are in the front line of this pandemic. Well, talking about a little bit more uh, about the hospital where I work. Actually, I work both in private and public hospitals, but of my time I spent here in this private hospital. Santa Joana now is a group of five matern four maternity hospitals in Brazil and we are one of the biggest, biggest private maternity hospitals in the country. Uh, just for you to know a little a bit more about the context where we are talking about the hospital, the main hospital has uh, about more than uh, 70 years so far. It's a private hospital we have huge numbers in terms of births. We have close to uh, 15,000 deliveries um, a year just in one single hospital. Uh, the hospital has 220 adult beds, 130 neonatal ICU beds, more than 1,500 employees, and just working here at this, this the, the anesthesia department at Santa Joana, we have 90 anesthesiologists that are in charge of covering 24 by 7 uh, anesthesia shifts. Mode of delivery, as you might know, yeah, yes, Emilia was just talking about 50 or 60 percent C-section rate. And nowadays we have a huge program to reduce the C-section rates in private hospitals, but our numbers are still running around 85 or uh, 89 C-section rate. So the regular the, the regular rule here is uh, when we have a patient that comes to a private hospital, uh, this does not happen only at Santa Joana, it happens at other private hospitals in Brazil. Uh, most of people would come and ask for an elective C-section. Uh, the hospital is really nice. Uh, the quality of care here, despite the C-section rate, I would say that's excellent. We have very, very nice facilities. We have like seven C-section rooms, a regular C-section room is showing that picture that I'm showing to you. Uh, we do have all the conditions to do a very, very nice uh, 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 vaginal delivery. We have like labor and delivery units that's like that. Uh, uh, people can have access to labor and analgesia 24 hours, seven days a week. So the C-section rate is a, uh, a cuter problem. I would say that uh, it's not like they choose the C-section in a private hospital because they are afraid of having pain. This is not true. You know, we, we can offer the best quality of care in terms of anesthesia. We have a nice recovery room. In, in summary, you have all the conditions to provide good quality of care in terms of medical care in a private hospital like this. 
But talking about COVID, what was the impact that we have in our department and how we are running that with all those elective cases coming uh, every day during the pandemic, you know? Uh, for sure, the, this disease, uh, it has an impact on health, not only on the uh, health of patients, but health of the professionals. Uh, it has an impact of, on social relations and also in an economy. So how di did we deal with all those uh, 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 those problems, you know. Uh, thinking that we have to take care both of the professional who is in the front line and also uh, taking care, providing good, qu good quality of care for patients, we had to be very fast in terms of education and agility and discipline to rapidly implement the new routines. The first case of COVID-19 happened here on 15 March, and it rapidly went up. So we really had to, to invest really quick in education and changing all the flow inside the hospital in order to make this happen in a safe way. So uh, we rapidly introduced donning and doffing uh, 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 techniques of per, uh, professional personal equipment. Uh, we developed separate flows to take care of patients with the uh, co both confirmed and under investigation of COVID-19. This is still problematic here because we are now uh, all aware of the asymptomatic uh, patients that can be up to 10% of the cases, but whenever we can, we test everybody, but we still have patients coming uh, uh, without testing or w without, uh, that did the test, but uh, not having time able to, to get the results. But anyway, uh, we, we have two very separate flows for the, for the symptomatic patients and for the ones who have a confirmed COVID-19 uh, uh, case. And uh, we are very fortunate to have a simulation center here inside the hospital, but we also use a lot of simulation in situ for professional training of the new procedures because uh, especially in the beginning, in the, the early phase of the pandemic, we are changing our policies every single day. So we implemented the simulation in situ, we are debriefing each and every cases, we are adjusting all our policies like in real time. And having like uh, within these 90 anesthesiologists, I have like 10 of them who are fully trained in a simulation and they helped really a lot in the early phase of the pandemic to implement all the changes and the new flows and uh, how to don and off. Because uh, in the beginning, people, all the health professions were also very stressed because uh, we didn't know uh, the disease very well. So everybody was really afraid of getting infected and even die with the disease. So in the, our ICU care, because we are a maternity hospital, people were not used to do like the turning the patients uh, down and uh, up, uh, like to, 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 increase, the, to uh, increase the ventilation. So uh, we are training full-time training all the professionals to, to, to have a better quality of care in our hospitals. In terms of social relations, uh, and as I discussed previously, in, especially in the beginning, you know, everybody was under a lot of pressure at home and at work. Nobody knows how the disease will develop. So most of our professions who were taking care of uh, confirmed cases here opted to leave their own houses and uh, are living in small apartments. At the hospital here in the beginning, they, uh, the hospital direction the hospital direction offer, uh, they hire a hotel near the, 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 the hospital and are offering 
uh, uh, free nights for the professionals who didn't want to come back to their own houses. And, uh, and also because people are just coming and going, they come in the evening and go back home without having the possibility to have any extra time for leisure, uh people are really working were really working under a lot of stress and in terms of economy there's also the good side there's the bad side of the pandemic but also the good side of the pandemic you know because uh, as a group as we knew that we are going to face difficult economic times because in brazil a lot of people uh, lost their jobs and uh, these would have an impact on the uh, their access to come into private hospitals because they would lose their health insurance. We are organizing our uh, lives as a group. And so we implemented the daily anesthesia schedule, which was very good. You know, we are like live, uh, uh, adjusting like uh, with 24 hours ahead. Uh, adjusting the, the our own schedule uh, with the according to the flow of the patients, we always have we always have to have like extra people because of being in obstetric service, and 40% of our daily cases are 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 not really emergencies, but they are like scheduled within the day, so we have to have extra resources in terms of the anesthesia professionals. But during this pandemic, since we started, we optimized our daily anesthesia schedule in a way that we didn't use to do in the past. And also because of having to remove all the material that was inside the operating room, like to do a regular, a regular C-section, not to be contaminated with the with the coronavirus, we now implemented a, a, a new way to design the, the, the surgical rooms, like uh, just limiting uh, inside the room what's really necessary to do a case. So we took the, actually the so, pandemic. Sorry, sorry yes. Monica, could you, we are running out of time. Could okay. you try to shorten yes. your, your excuse okay. me for the interruption? So the last results, uh, just to show like the two more slides, uh, to, so, to show that uh, our experience taking care uh, of uh, running uh, 135 days of COVID pandemic here. The distribution according to severity disease, it's the same as non-pregnant patients. We had 5% of critical ill patients. With critical ill, it means that the ones who had to be intubated or they had more than 50% uh, of the uh, uh, lung compromise in the CT scan with a respiratory dis dis distress. Patients, we had eight patients so far with the critical ill form of the disease and no maternal death so far. They remain intubated for around 40 days, but all them uh, were discharged from the hospital without any other comorbidities despite being uh, the pulmonary function that are still under rehabilitation. And uh, the, the, uh, a little bit different from what you show, uh, the most frequent uh, complaint of those patients that were admitted to the hospital were fever followed by cough and runny nose. So I would like to finish my presentation and as a message, um, uh, I, I would like to leave that we really face uh, really difficult times here in Brazil, but uh, having a, 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 a lot of friendship among the colleagues, we are, uh, we are going through this period uh, uh, much stronger than uh, when we started. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monica. And we are going uh, straight to uh, introduce Dr. Walkner that we have uh, introduced uh, her before from Addis Abeba. And she will speak about anesthetic management and what needs to be considered during the pandemic. Whenever you want, Dr. Walkner, you can start sharing your screen with us. Thank you very much. 
Okay. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening from uh, for audiences watching from everywhere around the world. Um, thank you, and thank you, uh, Lifebox, for inviting me to speak. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll be rushing and, and not make repetitions as much as possible. Okay. So today I'll be focusing on uh, obstetric anesthesia and miss COVID-19. Specifically, I'll be uh, focusing on healthcare worker safety and also anesthetic management uh, with regards to safety. Um, so I am from Ethiopia. Uh, I work at Gangi Memorial Hospital. So I'll be sharing uh, some of the uh, the challenges that we face in obstetric and aesthetic care in Ethiopia. And also uh, I will have uh, initially a global and local overview uh, and specific aesthetic management, what needs to be considered during a pandemic and how can we keep the healthcare provider safe and we'll put some recommendations at the end. So this is taken from the John Hopkins uh, Resource Center. As you can see, the um, global pandemic of COVID-19 has, um, as of yesterday, has infected nearly uh, 10, more than 27 million um, patients and about 900,000 deaths globally and encountered 188 countries. And coming to my country, Ethiopia specifically, as of yesterday, we had about 60,784 cases of COVID-19 and deaths about 949. And this has uh, significantly affected our uh, clinical practice as well as patient outcome. I'll be sharing how. Uh, shortly. So to start with some of the challenges that we face as anesthesia care providers, specifically for obstetric anesthesia uh, in low resource setting, uh, especially in Ethiopia, um, to start with the PPE shortage. I don't think this is a problem of the low income country anymore. It's a global problem, but I think it is among the worst situations to see in low income countries as most of these uh, PPEs come imported from other countries and those countries have sport, uh, stopped uh, importing them for their own uh, personal use. So that has created a problem and also in terms of understanding among the general population that these PPEs, some of the PPEs needs to be reserved for uh, healthcare providers uh, is not that much, um, that degree of awareness doesn't exist. So you may see people on the streets wearing N95 and then you may see healthcare providers in close proximity with uh, possible uh, suspect of COVID-19 wearing uh, inadequate or overused PPEs. The other problem that I'd like to list is untested. The, the number of untested patients is significantly high, uh, which makes the care we provide significantly difficult um, and uh, delayed results of COVID-19. This patient, this affects not only the healthcare providers, but also the care we give for the, uh, for the mothers that come. Um, the other problem that we see is that most of these obstetric surgeries, they, since they cannot po be postponed, even though we don't have uh, the COVID results on our hands, we may proceed with what we have. There is a lot of emergency surgeries being done, inadequate PPE, um, uh, especially even working guidelines may not be in the hands of the providers. They are being done in my country by the Ministry of Health, by professional societies being done, but they may not be available on the hands of the providers or not being practiced uh, at the healthcare facility. So um, the care that we provide for COVID-19 positive patients or suspects or patients under investigations might be somehow compromised or the healthcare provider safety can be compromised as well. The other important thing that I'd like to mention is the indirect effect of COVID-19 on healthcare. Um, it's my personal belief that, that rather than the direct effect of the COVID-19, um, patients be getting infected, patient dying, 
of COVID-19 ARDs, multi organ failure, and so on. I think what has in fact affected us most is that most of the resources are being allocated to um, COVID-19. I mean, we already have a resource limitation in our setup. And um, even with that resource limitation, much of it is being diverted to COVID-19 care. So we're losing patients um, that we think are salvageable who are losing non-COVID patients uh, because some institution might refuse ICU admission, for example, or dialysis might be refused uh, because the COVID result is pending. So the testing issue is significant in our uh, setup. Mechanical ventilators might be set aside for COVID cases or COVID ICU and so on. So we're losing those, the one we can save with salvageable ones. We're losing children, we're losing mothers um, with complications, you know, for the concept of COVID-19 uh, existing. And some of the patients, they might miss their follow-up in fear of showing up in the healthcare facilities because they fear that the healthcare providers themselves are infectious, you know, they might get the disease from the provider. So many patients might not even come to their regular follow-ups. So we, I think we need to back this up with data, but many uh, patients are coming with more severe complications. And so the, um, the, the way we help them I and mean, the prognosis of these patients showing up late after complications is going to be, uh, have a, uh, a very poor outcome. So these are some of the challenges that we face in my country, that, we, uh, that uh, it's an ongoing process right now. So now coming to the anesthetic parts, considerations for labor and delivery, every institution should implement uh, a pre-hospital screening as much as possible. In our setup, I mean, this. We cannot screen every patient, but at least you can uh, screen them for symptoms, uh, for elective procedures. You can do elective cesarean deliveries and, uh, and uh, um, vaginal deliveries. You can do screening for such patients. Uh, and whenever there is a phone available, they should be phoned the night before for symptoms of COVID. And as much as possible, we have to keep in mind that the partner who is going to be around uh, for delivery and delivery should also be uh, part of this screen. So regarding staff training and equipment, we need to focus on, I think most of these things are being, uh, have been already said, so I will not repeat them as much as possible, but just emphasize on the most important ones. We need to focus on who will be in the room, minimize as many, many staff as possible. Those who are uh, only uh, you know, relevant staff for the management of the patient should be in the room. We have to think about the neonates that's about to come and we think about separation of the neonate from the, inf uh, from the mother, uh, from the, 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 from the mother because there is a risk of infection and the NICU team should be part of that plan as much as possible. I think this has already be, been said by Dr. Emilia, but simulation of scenarios really helps. Simulation of donning and doffing, simulation of transporting of such patients, simulation of uh, patients arriving in the labor and delivery and so on. This kind of uh, scenar simulation scenarios help us prepare uh, and organize the team that's about to take care of uh, a COVID positive patient or a patient under investigations. And I think it's very important to have a COVID-19 kit available on our pockets, a pocket. In our uh, country, Ethiopia, the Ethiopian Society of uh, uh, Obstetricians and Gynecologists have come up with a COVID-19 kit, which is very comprehensive. And I think the Anastasia Society also needs to follow on that and uh, prepare a small kit so that people can easily access those uh, COVID-19 kits. Um, and also we think about limiting visitors and support. It's a very cultural you know, uh, tradition to actually 
visit the mother uh, post delivery and even uh, during labor there's a lot of companies we may, they may not be allowed in but there are a lot of that's just a traditional and cultural kind of things so that kind of awareness is to be created so uh, Anastasia Patient Safety Foundation has given us a guideline for management of women who tested positive for COVID-19 or persons under investigations. In our setup, most of them will be persons under investigations if they come for emergency cesarean section or delivery because that result will not be on our hands. It may take days to get those results. So delaying the termination of pregnancy, for example, for severe preeclampsia, it may, uh, we may be forced to go ahead and uh, perform cesarean section or terminate pregnancy without the results on hand. So for those uh, patients um, who you think are suspects or COVID positive or person under investigation, you need to admit them to a designated isolation area. And all healthcare workers, uh, should implement full PPE when taking care of these patients. Donning and doffing takes time. It has already been mentioned. There is no emergency in a pandemic. Um, prepare yourselves for donning and doffing. Simulate well. Um, to continue with that, epidural analgesia, it may reduce the need for general anesthesia for emergency uh, cesarean deliveries. So you should prefer, if, if you have that set up, prefer uh, using that. Um, and neuroaxial, we have to keep in mind that neuroaxial anesthesia is not a contraindication for, um, uh, and being COVID positive is not a contraindication to have a neuroaxial anesthesia. It's actually better to have a neuroaxial anesthesia, but keeping in mind the coagulopathy that the patients might have, it has already been mentioned. So it's worth checking the platelet count and coagulation profile of such patients when you provide neuroaxial anesthesia for such patients. As much as possible, emergencies around delivery should be uh, avoided. Communicate with the obstetric team, communicate with the NICU, communicate with the um, 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 maternal ICU if needed, and avoid emergencies around deliveries. Uh, in the room, in the operation theater, have the most experienced anesthesia provider available so that manipulation and aerosol generation is minimized and minimize the personnel in the room in general, minimize the use of trainees uh, and have the experts do it. If general anesthesia is the only option, that would be the last resort. If regional is better, if regional is the option, then use regional. But if general anesthesia and intubation is mandatory, then you, uh, you should uh, opt for wearing full PPE, N95 masks for, uh, for the provider, face shields, gowns, gloves, double gloves, um, and for the patient as well, the patient should wear a surgical mask. That's something that we follow in our setup. Um, and make sure that you follow a checklist, the donning and doffing checklist uh, that's being practiced nowadays. Uh, and also the checklist that's provided by the WFSA as well as the safety checklist for COVID positive patient, COVID uh, uh, scenarios and the WHO surgical safety checklist as well. So checklist should come in mind, all sorts of checklists, the donning and doffing as well. And um, in case of a life-threatening situation where there is general anesthesia indicated, wear at least N95 masks and double gloves. Um, when you are doing a pre-oxygenation, remember the HEPA filters need to be placed between the patient and the surgeons. So use a uh, closed suction system if available. In our setup, that's not available. You need, you need to actually open the airway and suction if needed. So if it's available to you, use a closed suction system. Um, as much as possible, success on the first attempt of intubation should be considered. Extubation is highly aerosolizing. So that should be the, the time where a minimal number of personnel should be in the room. So only uh, those are, that are essential for those extubation management uh, uh, should be in within the room and wearing full PPE. That's very important. Where uh, aerosol generating procedures are performed, PPE 
should be full PPE should be worn and there are a lot of guidelines out there available. Uh, a lot of reference are there also for you to see. Uh, but the one that I have seen is the one uh, from World Federation Society of Anesthesiologists where so many societies are involved in this, where you, uh, as you can see, a lot of uh, recommendations have come for labor ward, for operation theater, and for non safe substitute theater cases, and what in what scenario. So you can check this out on the WFSA website resource center, which is available to us. Uh, but we keep in mind that whenever there is aerosol generating procedure, a full PPE uh, is required. So, Doctor, Doctor Radiate, could you try to summarize because we are running out of time? Yeah. Could you try to be to become shorter? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Thank you, no problem. Uh, so for labor epidural anesthesia, always consider at least wearing a surgical mask um, and a gown. And uh, for caesarean delivery, uh, a full PPE as much as possible. Uh, and uh, especially for aerosol generating procedures, this was a last slide actually. So some of the recommendations, this is a last slide, I would put would be to actually plan, plan and simulate scenarios, uh, scenarios ahead of time. Uh, every uh, recommendation and guideline out there should be adopted to the local context because everything varies in, um, in low-income countries, so that needs to be adopted. Uh, we should encourage testing as much as possible because unable, being unable to get the testing results has impacted patient management and also the clinical care that we give for our patients. Uh, use available tools to protect self and patients. PPE, surgical masks for the patient, remember regional anesthesia is preferred. Put HEPA filters if you have, and as much as possible, minimize aerosolizing procedure. Remember to clamp the into tube to minimize aerosolization. But remember, one thing that I'd like to point out is that every patient, COVID positive or negative, or a patient under investigation, uh, um, requires the same care. And you should not lose the ones you can save. So just be reminded that uh, COVID should not hamper us from uh, giving uh, the right care that we provide for those who are untested. Uh, so thank you. These are my references and acknowledgements to the Cancer Society of Obstetricians and Gynecology and WFSA and the rest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to all the panelists. We are almost uh, run out of time, but we have still 15 minutes to answer questions. I'd like to start uh, with one question from the audience, that it's a clinical challenge for all of us. Let's try to see if we all agree. Our lectures um, are all in the same sense. We, it looks as we have been sleeping together for one week and doing the presentations all together, but let's see a clinical challenge. There is one question that it's, what is the choice of anesthesia for maternal respiratory insufficiency, COVID-19 positive mother in labor develops, non resident fetal heart rate pattern, fetal tachycardia or bradycardia or others, secondary to uteroplacental insufficiency. Shall we consider spinal anesthesia for another spinal, spinal hypotension, which might affect neonatal outcome, outcomes? So uh, let me uh, summarize. It's a lady in labor who develops a non-reassuring fetal heart rate pattern and uh, we have to go for an emergency C-section. She doesn't have an epidural catheter in, and we have to choose which is our technique. Please, feel free to answer. Monica, your, your microphone is off. Hi. Uh, here in Brazil, uh, we would try to do spinal anesthesia as long as we think uh, there's a chance to do it and do an early conversion uh, to general anesthesia. No, uh, but I, I would say that 
um, and dealing with those patients. Uh, like uh, we, we, we are seeing here in Brazil that the clinical scenario doesn't match with the, the exams. We, ha we had a, a bit of everything. We have patients with more than 50% of their lung compromised in the CT scan, and they were tolerating, okay, the spinal anesthesia, you know? But we tried to deliver the baby under uh, regional anesthesia. And, and if it's necessary, convert early on to general anesthesia. That's, uh, but there are times that there were cases that because the mother was uh, with a respiratory rate, arrived at the hospital with 40 uh, uh, breaths per minute. And in that one, she just needed to be intubated. So we intubated her and delivered the baby right away. So it depends the case, you know, it's the, the, the clinical way that you are seeing in every case, but it's difficult to predict uh, like uh, the amount that they have in the CT scan and the clinical picture, the things that here in Brazil, things doesn't match. Dr. Shah, Dr. Rumet, any, any, Anything to add? Dr. Shah, your, your microphone is off. I agree with uh, Dr. Monica, Monica because uh, the situation that this mother is COVID positive and uh, respiratory insufficiency is there. But another indication is the uterine insufficiency, that is again an emergency. Uh, for caesarean section. So again, it is difficult uh, to say that if we go with the uh, spinal, let's say in non-COVID, we can think of rapid sequence spinal. But right now it is very difficult to say that uh, rapid sequence spinal possible with this COVID scenario, because we need to take all the precautions. So it will take time for the spinal anesthesia. And again, it will, uh, hypotension can be, uh, uh, problem for this uh, uh, can create a problem with this patient. Now respiratory insufficiency we can go with uh, even general anesthesia but it will be difficult to say that uh, outcome for this patient that will be difficult again to say about this. Dr. Radiet, thank you very much Dr. Shah. Dr. Radiet, please, do you have anything to, to add to this uh, question? to this challenge? Yeah. yeah, so I think it all depends on the patient's clinical presentation, if she, the severity score of the COVID-19 during her pregnancy. So if she has severe respiratory symptoms uh, and the patient might be agitated, we might opt for general anesthesia, anesthesia but um, the patient has respiratory uh, symptoms, but not agitated enough, uh, so she can sit and have a rapid spinal, uh, then spinal would be still effective during that time. So I would say it depends on her clinical presentation, whether she has severe symptoms of agitation and also respiratory distress that would go for GA and the other way around for spinal. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to highlight, uh, from my point of view, an important aspect of this clinical challenge. It is important, uh, something that we have highlighted during our lectures, about communication, communication in, in the team, and to try to avoid as much as possible a category one C-section. For those who are not used to, to, to use that kind of classification, category one C-section, is uh, all that C-section that put in a, that mother or fetus are at vital risk. Category two are risk for mothers or fetus, but not vital risk. So we, we, we have to try to avoid that kind of risks. So if we are under a category one C-section, we have to do the fastest, technique, we can perform safely. And we have to try to avoid a category one C-section with communication. And in this particular case that doesn't look so emergent, I go for a spinal, uh, for a spinal anesthesia, a fast spinal anesthesia under 
uh, hyperbary bupivacaine plus fentanyl plus morphine, and I think it could be well managed. And in terms of prevention of hypotension, I would start with ephedrine before the uh, placement of the spinal uh, uh, technique. Ephedrine, if you have available, if you have uh, phenylephrine, phenylephrine, because it is better from the fetal point of view. And if you even have an, a continuous infusion pump, you can use it to prevent hypotension and also nausea and vomiting. That's my point of view. Uh, there are um, several questions and one of the last questions that has been asked is what about the prevention of uh, the neonates? Well, we have done all we could to try to avoid vertical transmission and we have delivered a healthy baby. How should we prevent the, that the baby becomes COVID positive? Is there any protocol in any of your countries? Yes. Actually, um, in our country, ICMR guidelines, that is Indian Council of Medical Research, uh, they, to, they have created a protocol that the mother and baby separation after delivery. So that is again uh, helpful to uh, that uh, baby should come positive. But even breastfeeding is allowed for these babies, but uh, we ask mother to take all the precautions, uh, maintain hand hygiene and put the face mask before each breastfeeding. So with due precautions, we can avoid the chances of getting infection to the unit. Any other comment? Monica? Yes, here in Brazil, uh, we are not seeing vertical transmission at all. You know, we do have some babies infected in the puerperium, you know, and the way we do it, even with the positive patients, we do not separate mothers from the baby unless the patient goes to the ICU as intubated. So we teach the patients like to, to, to be apart from the, neo, the neone, neonate, at least two meters apart. And during breastfeeding, do a straight uh, hand hygiene and, and use uh, masks for breastfeeding, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's the policy here at the hospital. Dr. Rediet? So yeah, here in Ethiopia, the Ethiopian Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists have put uh, uh, a recommendation and uh, um, it suggests that uh, if the neonate is admitted to the NICU, then the mother will not be allowed to uh, enter the NICU without being uh, cleared of COVID and being symptom free for um, seven days since the initial start of symptoms or fever free. Uh, and also they have put a recommendation on breastfeeding uh, the patient, the mother should have a face mask on and uh, complete hand hygiene while taking care of the neonates and also uh, for pumping as well for those who cannot uh, who, who cannot breastfeed directly. Pumping is also possible but keeping all the possible sterility and uh, uh, cleanliness uh, as much as possible. Thank you. I also agree, it's the same policy in our hospital in, in Spain. So I think we have um, a very few minutes until the end. Let's try to, to do uh, an, another question that it's uh, important for me. And that, do any of you have, been, uh, have seen challenges your normal obstetric practice? And do you think that uh, obstetric patients' safety has been challenged because of COVID-19, even in non-COVID patients? For sure, in Spain, it has been challenged. Dr. Rediet, please. Yeah. yeah, I think I have, I've mentioned some of it in my presentation, but 
I, what's closely um, close to my heart is the patients I have recently handled and uh, being the, uh, affected by this COVID-19 directly, indirectly or indirectly. I've had patients being refused uh, dialysis postpartum um, just because they didn't have COVID results on hand. Sometimes COVID results uh, it doesn't come for five days and the mother cannot wait for five days without, you know, without receiving the care she, uh, she requires. Or maybe ICU admission as is refused because not every institution has uh, COVID designated ICU. So if there is pending COVID results, then ICU admission has been compromised for such patients. And among even healthcare providers, not every healthcare provider feels confident to get close to such suspects or uh, untested patients. So that kind of compromisation of care is there. So uh, I think that has significantly affected us uh, here in my country. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I do agree. You know, as a country, we certainly had that all as well. Uh, at the private hospital, the experience is that we saw, and this is very sad, some of their regular doctors not coming to do the, the, the birth just because the patient is a COVID-19 patient and those patients are, are seen by the on-call doctor. Uh, but inside the hospital, despite not being seen by their own doctors, the quality of care, I would say that it's still the same. You know, we are very used to work with protocols. We are aware of uh, uh, people might be distracted uh, about not taking care of preeclampsia or not taking care of maternal hemorrhage. So since the beginning of this pandemic, we just keep an eye on making sure that all the other protocols that save mother's life here inside the hospital are running perfectly. The one thing that we saw and we are just looking at our data is that it increased the number of units of blood that's being used in the hospital because in the beginning we, we didn't uh, thought that it would be a problem in COVID-19 patients, you know, uh, but especially in the critical ill patients and because of maybe receiving anticoagulants and the uh, coagulation disturbance, even procoagulation and, uh, and bleeding more, uh, we during this past six months clearly consumed more blood in the hospital and we are checking if this is because directly of COVID-19 or are we missing somebody and we are not being, um, uh, you know, uh, arriving at the right time for a hemorrhage case, for instance. We know we are still understanding our data. Well, it is six, uh, one minute past six, and we have uh, to finish this, uh, this interesting webinar. I hope interesting also for, for you. And uh, I want to thank you Thank you and thank you to our panel today. And thank you, thank you, thank you to Lightbox and to WFSA and for you all for joining us today. We want to express our gratitude and support for all healthcare providers and around the world as they work on the front line to tackle this pandemic. We stand alongside you. Video and audio recording of this will be available at lifebox.org next week and Lifebox will email all registrants of the webinar with a link to the recording. Good luck for the second wave if, if it happens and thank you very much. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Thank you.